Hi everybody, okay, welcome back. We're looking at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek. We're about halfway through chapter three and I want to give you some worked examples for the, some of the halfway practice questions on page 33 and page 34. I do encourage you to do these questions. It is doing the exercises which will ingrain the grammar and the vocab and so on that you've been learning. So let's kick straight off with it. Uh, here's the first example, a nice uh, Greek into English uh, example. Number four, poiete arton tois adelphois. Poiete arton tois adelphois. Well, where do we begin? As always, I encourage you to start with the verb. So look through these, see if you can find the verb. Pause the video and give yourself a chance to find it. The verb, that's right, is poiete. It comes from the verb poieo. Poieo, which is an eo verb, which alters the ending slightly. So it goes poio, poies, poie, poiumen, poiete, poiusin. So as you're uh, chanting through those, you would have noticed that this is poiete. So that second person plural of poieo, meaning I do or I make, and therefore it's second person. So the persons are first person is I, second person is you, third person is he, she, it, they, and so on. So the second person plural, it's you, plural, are doing, or are making, or do, or make, or something of that sort. So at this stage of the translation, keep all your options open and write them all down. So do, or make, or are doing, or making, and I promise you, at this stage of your uh, Greek study, you will never regret learning uh, to get into the habit of writing down uh, all of the, the options for translation. Uh, let's keep the second person plural thing there, just so we remember it. And it won't, you won't go astray far because you'll, you'll learn to uh, keep track of all the possible range of meanings uh, that a particular word or phrase or sentence could have. Okay, so verb. The next thing we look for is the subject. Well, at this stage of your study, you're not expecting to find a separately lexicalized subject because this is in the second person. And if there was a separate subject, for example, like um, the man or uh, Jesus, then this verb would have to be in the third person because it's he or she doing it. This is in the second person, so verb is done. You're not expecting to find a subject. What do we look for next? Verb, subject, object. We look for next, and an object will be a noun in which case? That's right, it will be in the accusative case. So look through here and see if you can find anything in the accusative case. What are the options? Arton, tois, adelphois. Where is the noun in the accusative case? Can you find it? Of course you can. It's arton, comes from the word artos, meaning, can you remember? Bread, excellent. Bread, so artos, arton, artu, arto, artoi, artus, arton, artois, arton, is accusative singular, and so it just means bread. And maybe you want to put a little circle around that and remind yourself that it's the object. There we are. Just never be afraid to write down your working, scribble over all the all over the sheet that you've been given to do that one on. So you do or make or are doing or are making bread. Well, already what you can start to see is because you've translated not just the verb but also its object. The translation of the object has constrained slightly the range of possible meanings that the verb can have. You don't normally talk about doing bread, do you? You talk about making bread. You might conceivably talk about doing the bread. You might say, who's doing the bread for Holy Communion this week? But normally we talk about making bread, don't we, in English? And therefore we can get rid of that and we can get rid of this. What, this is an example of what we mean when we're studying any language, when we say that the context narrows down or even determines the range of possible meanings of every word involved. So poieta could mean do or make, but in this context, because of bread, it is uh, make or are making rather than do or are doing. Okay, so you make bread or you are making bread. Well, you've done the verb, you've done the subject, now we do everything else. And what we've got here is tois adelphois. Take a look at that, see where it comes from. It comes, of course, from Adel Foss. And this, um, oh, what am I doing? This comes from the article, ho, 
and it is in which case and which number just pause for a second see if you can remember work it out chant through in your head start with ho ton to toe hoi tus tone toys it is that's right dative plural and no surprise therefore by uh, the principle of agreement where nouns and uh, their articles have to agree in number and case and gender. This also is in the dative plural. And so it's brothers, not brother, brothers. Uh, but the dative case uh, gives the noun a particular meaning. It's two or for the thing, isn't it? Uh, dative is to or for something. Genitive is of something. So we translate toys at our voice to or for the brothers. Now, having got those sketched out, we've got all the various options that uh, these the different parts of this sentence this sentence could contribute to the overall meaning. We now have a look at it and we think, okay, which what makes most sense? And of course, you make or are making bread to the brothers or for the brothers? Well, quite plainly, it's not going to be uh, to the brothers, it's going to be for the brothers. So you would translate this, you are making, or perhaps you make bread for the brothers. You make, or you are making bread for the brothers. Poiete arton tois adelfois. Okay, that's number four. Let's uh, rock straight on and look at the next one, which is number eight. This one right here, I'm going to use a different colour pen. Get rid of that green there so as not to confuse you. Uh, number eight, hot Adelphos Lue Doulon To Curio. Hot Adelphos Lue Doulon To Curio. Now, just pause the video right here and see if you can uh, have a stab at translating this one on your own. Uh, remember, verb, subject, object, then everything else. So now you pause the video, let me go through and tell you what I make of it. As I look through, I look for the verb, I find lue. This comes from the verb, nah, right above it there. Uh, luo, meaning I untie. I untie. Luo, luais, lue, luomen, lueta, luusin. So luo, luais, lue, that's third person singular, meaning he unties or perhaps is un. Untying. He is untying. Now that's the verb. So now the subject, well, because this is a third person verb, it could, at this stage of your course, certainly have a separately lexicalized subject. He could be specifically somebody else or something else which is mentioned in the sentence. So is there anything here which is in the appropriate case? Well, what would be the appropriate case for the subject of a verb? The appropriate case for the subject of a verb would be the that's right, the nominative case. So look around here, can you find anything in the nominative case? And of course, you certainly can. Hot Adelphos is in the nominative case. The brother. The brother. Hot Adelphos. And therefore that replaces the subject which is built into Lue itself. And instead of the brother he unties, or perhaps the brother he is untying, we have the brother unties, or the brother is untying. So verb subject. The next thing we look for is the object. That's right, and we try and find an object. Uh, is there something in the accusative case? That's the appropriate case for the object. Well, we've got doulon to curio. Any of that in the accusative case? Of course it is. It's this one right here. Doulon from doulos, meaning rack your brains and see if you can remember. <laughs> doulos means a slave or slave. Doulos, doulon, doulou, doulo, douloi, douloos, doulon, doulois. It's another great exercise. Every time you hear a word or every time you're reminding yourself of a word, just go through its declension or its conjugation just to remind yourself of all that grammar and, and stuff all at once. Very fantastically useful, really. The brother unties or is untying slave or a slave. Notice there is no article here. There is an article here hot Adelphos, the brother, but there is no article here. It is not a particular slave who is being untied. The brother is untying or unties a slave. So verb, subject, object, all done safe and sound. What is left in this sentence to have a crack at? And of course, you've got this little bit at the end, to curio, and you've got to identify what it is and then try and figure out what it's doing in the sentence. Well, identify what it is. This is the article from ha, and this curio comes from 
curios. Notice uh, the thing that gives that away, by the way, and this is obvious, I know it's obvious to you, but the thing that gives that away is the stem, isn't it? Curio, curios, you look at the stem and the stem tells you which word it is. Hokurios means the Lord, but it's not in the uh, nominative case like hokurios, it's hot on to toe. Nominative, accusative, genitive, dative case, it's in the dative and it's singular because it's hot on to toe, hoi tone tus. Hoi tus tone toys. Listen to me, going all crazy here. Curio, so it's curios, curion, curio, curio in the singular. So this means the Lord, but it doesn't just mean that, does it? Because when we have something in the dative case, it customarily means to or for that thing. So we put both the options in. Not presuppose at this stage which of them might be the particular reading in this context. And so we've got the brother unties or is untying a slave to or for the Lord. Which one of those makes most sense? Well, I think it's for the Lord, isn't it? It's for the Lord in the sense of on behalf of the Lord or in, in, in accordance with the Lord's instructions, perhaps. Uh, Lord, of course, could mean master. Uh, and there's no way of telling that from the context here. If you were talking about slaves and masters and a slave had just uh, been released by his master, then probably master would be a more appropriate translation of curios. But if it was Jesus, then uh, who was in view, who was the one who'd commanded that a slave be released, then uh, the, the brother will be untying a slave for the Lord. And again, there's nothing that you can do to figure out which of those it means other than look at the context. And uh, unties or is untying, well again, there is no way of determining which of those is the right translation just from this sentence. But do note, of course, that really the reason why you're learning Greek is not so much that you can uh, work out which of these is the correct translation out of unties or is untying, but rather so that you're aware that the sentence as it is written carries this range of meaning and that that significance therefore is in your mind as you're reading the text. Uh, and so uh, we'll leave it at that. I mean, I don't know which one Duff chooses, perhaps is untying is slightly more idiomatic, isn't it? The brother is untying a slave for the Lord. Okay, so that's number eight. Hot Delphos, Lue, Doulon, To, Curio. Now, slightly more difficult, always slightly more difficult to go from um, uh, English into Greek. It's always more difficult to go into the language you're less familiar with because speaking or writing, excuse me, in a language requires greater familiarity uh, to construct something from new, so to speak, than it does just to read something that's already there. Uh, but here goes, uh, number 11. We'll have a crack at it anyway. We keep the law of heaven. We keep the law of of heaven. And so when you're translating this sentence, you want to do exactly the same thing in the, exactly the same order, but just in reverse, as you do when you translate Greek into English. You find the verb first. So where's the verb in this sentence? The verb, of course, is right here. It's keep. And the subject is we, which is the first person plural. Just take a moment to refresh your memory if that wasn't immediately obvious to you. The persons, first person, second person, third person, somebody else. I, you, he, she, or it, both in the singular or plural. So we, in the singular, first person plural. So we want the first person plural of I keep. Well, keep I keep is tereo, another eo verb, a little bit like poieo, and therefore the it slightly modifies the endings that we see on the uh, attached to the stem of the verb. Uh, in, and you, this is a, you can find this previous video all about that. So if you need to re remind yourself of eo verbs, then go ahead. But we have tero, teres, tere, terumen, terete, terusin. So terumen means we keep. Terumen. You notice what's actually happened is that the omen has turned to an u, a diphthong, just as the e epsilon had turned to an a, a diphthong up here, because the, the weak epsilon at the end of the stem of the verb likes to be in or uh, in a long, likes to turn into a long vowel or likes to be in a long vowel like a diphthong. So that's what's going on there. Terumen, we keep. Now that's the verb, no subject. Uh, except that which is 
internal to the verb itself, so no separately lexicalized subject, it's just we keep. And then the rest of the sentence, the law of heaven, well, we want to find the object. What is the thing that you're keeping? So verb, subject, object. The thing you're keeping is not the law of heaven, strictly, but the law. That's the object of the verb, and this then qualifies or defines the object. And of course it is the law of heaven you're keeping in terms of the meaning, but grammatically speaking the object is the law. Um, at least try and think of it that way for now, otherwise you're going to get confused over here. I know there are the, the super linguists among you will spot there are some philosophical questions there about whether which what is actually the object, but okay, come to that a long time in the future. Okay, we keep the law of heaven, or well, the law, it's going to be something from Ho and something from nomos, but it's going to be how many of them? Singular, because there's only one, and it's going to be in the accusative, because it's the object, so we want the accusative, singular of the law. So ho, ton, tu, to, hoi, tu, ton, tois, ho, ton, the law, the law, nomos, nomon. And do remember to do what I did very badly there, turn your news into upsilons at your peril. We want the news to have a nice sharp base to them so it doesn't look like a uh, but it looks like a new. So we keep the law and then we want of heaven. And so if you have a, uh, a noun phrase which is of something, then that goes in the genitive case. Uh, it's heaven that we want in the genitive case, which the word for which is uranos. Uranos, we keep of heaven and uh, this wants to be in the genitive case and therefore uranos, uranon, uranu. Okay, uranu. Genitive case. Right, so we keep the law of heaven. Terumen ton nomon uranu. Now one final subtlety about uh, this final example, number 11. If you look back in the back of Duff uh, in the answers, you will find that what Duff has done has also been to include the article in the genitive singular, to, masculine genitive singular, in brackets. Now why is that? Well the reason is because heaven, uranos, can have the article sometimes and sometimes does have the article uh, in uh, Greek, but not always, and therefore it will be legitimate probably to translate this terumen ton nomon to uranu, just as it will be legitimate to translate it terumen ton nomon uranu. In fact, we do something somewhat like that in English, but with the plural of heaven, don't we? So we talk about um, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, which kind of means the same sort of thing as heaven declares the glory of God, um, but when we talk about it in the plural at least, uh, we often use the article, the definite article, the, with it. And that's just another kind of uh, subtle quirk of English. Well, there are subtle quirks in every language, and here's one in Greek. Uh, uranos um, can uh, have the article sometimes, and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, either of these will be fine. Terumen ton nomon tu uranu. Okay. There you go, some examples for you to work on. There are plenty more examples uh, as you keep going through this chapter. I encourage you, as always, to keep going with them. Don't miss out the examples because you think you've learned the grammar. It's by doing the examples that you will learn and ingrain the grammar and the vocab. Keep working hard, 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week. We will have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. Okay, God bless. Bye for now. See you next time.